Hello and welcome to my channel. Today is a different topic <coughs> which is uh, common mode rejection choke measurements to prove that they're working. Um, you'll see why in a minute. Uh, by the way that is not an alien spacecraft, it's a lamp. Anyway, um, <coughs> as you probably know, coax cable looks like this and the idea is it has an inner conductor, let's look at this end, <coughs> and an outer conductor and the idea is that the inner conductor is shielded from any outside interference or is prevented from radiating out because of the shield which is around it. That's the idea. Um, but when you look a bit deeper into this, um, there's an effect called the skin effect. And as you increase frequency of signals, so the um, penetration into the surface of the conductor gets less and less. Let me just turn the audio down a bit because it seems to be going in the red now. <coughs> so um, at very high frequencies, the signals actually propagate on the outside surface of the conductor. Um, let's look at the inner conductor and, and don't penetrate in very much. And the same on the inside surface of the shield, then the signal doesn't really penetrate too much, which isn't a problem, except <clears throat> in fact, this coax cable doesn't just have three conductors, like the inner and the outer it has three surfaces. So there's the inner conductor, there's the inside surface of the shield, and there's also the outside surface of the shield and the outside of the cable, which forms a third conductor. And the problem is you can get it signals propagating independently on each of those three layers. <clears throat> so um, the effects of this you might notice is when transmitting that there is some radiation coming off the cable which can cause all kinds of problems because it gets back into my computer, gets picked up on the mouse lead, makes the, uh, the cursor freeze on the screen <laughs> when I'm transmitting. All kinds of things go wrong, so you need to prevent that. It can also be dangerous if the power level is higher then you can get an RF burn by touching some equipment. Normally, um, to measure antennas, I use <coughs> this antenna tester, which is very good. And one sure sign is, if you look at the SWR, which is low, hopefully, if you notice that when you touch the case of this instrument, then the SWR reading increases. That means there's some common mode signal on the outside of the coax, which needs to be got rid of. Another way of testing it is using some sort of a sniffing device like this. <coughs> this is... Uh, made in China, <laughs> like everything. This is an E-Field probe, and you can just put it near the coax and see if you get some reading of leakage from the coax. I've got another one that's a magnetic probe I made using some of these uh, clip-on ferrites to form a transformer around the coax and then a couple of <clears throat> turns of wire to a meter. That works very well, I'll show you that some other time. So um, that was transmitting with common mode problems. Of course, due to the theorem of reciprocity, <coughs> if uh, you can radiate a signal out of a coax cable on its shield, then of course it can also receive um, electromagnetic interference noise from surrounding devices that then gets into the coax and into the receiver, causing noise and interference problems. So you, you want to eliminate as much as you can <coughs> common mode um, signals on cables. And we do this using ferrites. Here's a ferrite. Um, <clears throat> ferrite ring, and I've experimented putting coax through here, making turns. The other way you do it is use these uh, clip-on, where's it gone? Uh, haven't thrown it away yet, but use these clip-on plastic ferrite holders. These, um, for me, don't really work because <clears throat> the two halves of the ferrite look like this, and the idea is they should be squeezed together as tightly as possible <clears throat> to make a magnetic closed loop, and then you put the cable through. And when you use the uh, plastic clip, for me, it's not tight enough, doesn't really work. So I throw these things away and I get some sticky tape instead, black masking tape, and I wrap that round instead to hold the halves together. Um, and you can do all these things and you can hope that it works, but of course I want to measure if it really works. And the way to measure it is to use a um, <coughs> common mode uh, measurement device. And uh, there are not too many designs around that I've seen. Um, I'll show you the one I found on YouTube and this is the one I made. This is by Halibut Electronics, nothing fishy about that. <clears throat> I'll link to this video in the description. And what happens is you uh, take your nano VNA, if you have one, I recommend you get one if you don't, <laughs> and you use this to measure the insertion loss of the shield of the coax, not just the center conductor, which is what people might normally want to do. So using this uh, circuit what happens is the nano VNA <coughs> two ports are connected to the device under test. Two ports, which is usually a piece of coax cable you're trying to test. And then you throw the switch between two positions. Um, that switch is currently in position number one, which actually connects the inner 
of the nano VNH port to the um, outer of the coax cable. I'm just checking if I'm, I'm saying that right. Yes, I am. <clears throat> so the uh, the inner of the coax is still connected through as it should be, but then in parallel with that, it's the outer shield connected. If you switch to position number three on those two switches, which are ganged together, then the system is as normal and the ground of the coax device under test is grounded to everything else. So when it's pointing at three, it's the normal position, and in position one, you're measuring the uh, the outer insertion loss. So <clears throat> if we go back, what I did was I built that circuit with a switch and oh I have to take the lid off show you what's inside. This is uh, my interpretation of that design. This white box here you can see with <clears throat> the two ports and there's the switch which can be in one of two positions either straight through or test. So you can check the coax works normally first, measure the insertion loss, then you throw the switch to the test position and it then measures the insertion loss on the outer of the coax, not the inner, um, which is uh, an interesting thing to do. So um, <clears throat> what I can do is I can switch on my VNA, it should go beep, so the battery's charged, two beeps, and that's doing the right thing. So that's going from zero to 30 megahertz, and it's measuring that coaxial cable insertion loss the, uh, let's just look at the yellow curve. The blue one's SWR, so let's ignore that. <clears throat> the yellow curve, you can see, sorry, this is a bit out of focus, I'm using a laptop, is flat from 0 to 30 megahertz, and the insertion loss is very, very low. That yellow curve is very close to the zero line on the screen, which is here. Now, if I flick the switch over, you'll see what the insertion loss is through that ferrite choke, which is about four turns of coax through the ferrite ring. I hope it's ferrite. It could also be uh, um, iron powder, powdered iron. Problem is, you buy these on Amazon, you don't really know what is inside the ferrite. I'm not going to do that anymore. It's a bit of a lucky dip lottery what's in there. So when I th throw the switch, you'll see the trace changes. And we're looking at the yellow one. <clears throat> and as you can see, the insertion loss uh, increases. So we've got 0 dBs insertion loss down at uh, DC, let's say. And as you get up to the top of the scale, that's 30 megahertz, insertion loss there is about 12 or 14 dBs. And it's a fairly flat line sloping downwards. And if you want to use this at 7 megs or 10, uh, 14 megahertz or something, the insertion loss is less than 10 dBs, which is not very much. So obviously this um, ferrite, whatever it is, is designed for <clears throat> higher frequency use. It doesn't work down at low frequencies at all. And I was quite disappointed because I made this uh, choke to block common mode. And then when I tested it, I saw that test result. And uh, that's not really very good at all. So what I'm going to do is take off that uh, choke that I made and put on a different one. So just unscrew it. The different one is this. This is much easier to make as well <clears throat> without trying to put these plugs through the uh, center of the fabric ring. This is just a piece of, I think it's one meter long RG58. And it's got three of those ferrites on it, these ones that come in the clip, which I throw away. And I've wrapped sticky tape around to make sure they're really fixed on there firmly. So what I'm going to do that now is connect that to this test jig, which you can't see. <clears throat> and then we'll measure this, see how it performs. So let's do up <clears throat> these two plugs. And what do we have? Probably get this upside down now. <laughs> oh no, everything's back to front. It's like looking in a mirror. So um, there you can see again the transmission through the coax when it's used normally has got zero dBs of insertion loss. The yellow line is flat at zero dBs. Maybe I can show that with this finger. This is an exercise in being ambidextrous. So that's what you'd expect. Well, let's throw the switch to the test position now and measure the insertion loss of the outer braid of the coax because of the ferrite rings. And oh, as you can see, <clears throat> it's completely different. Now we've got a dip. And that dip, if I can read it on my screen, is at 14 megahertz. It's minus 27 dBs where the marker is on the VNA, that yellow marker is 14 megahertz, <clears throat> which is a frequency I like to use. And we've got uh, minus 27 dBs insertion loss, which is very good. And down at 7 megahertz, it's still more than 20 dBs. I think at 21 megahertz, it's still more than 20 dBs. And when you get up to 30 megahertz, it's about What's that? <clears throat> Maybe 17 dB insertion loss, which is is okay. In fact, if you take off one of these ferrites, then the, the frequency shifts up. So the dip in the curve moves higher up the frequency scale. So you can actually optimize this choke 
for different frequencies. If you put an extra ferrite on here to have four instead of three, then that curve shifts down to give more insertion loss at seven megs, but then it suffers <coughs> with a slightly worse performance of 14 megahertz. So if you know what band you want to use, you can put the right number of ferrites on here. And I found this is a very useful way of testing homemade um, common mode blocking chokes. It's also called an unun because it's unbalanced to unbalanced um, and it's a current mode unun because the uh, the connections are made directly <coughs> from the inner to the outer on each side. It's not like a transformer with a primary and a secondary which would be a, a voltage unun. So um, this works very well, has very low loss and doesn't really cause any problems on transmit or receive but uh, it does remove those common mode signals which are unwanted. <coughs> so um, I look forward to reading your comments in the comments below. Any questions, feel, feel free to ask, please. And any re recommendations for particular ferrites, because these ones turned out not to be good for HF. <coughs> I thought they looked nice because of the color. They've got a different color on the back, but um, I'm going to find a different supplier for ferrite. I think the Fair Right company um, is one to try next, because they, uh, they're they more honest, I think, about what ferrites they're selling. <coughs> so I'm going to try making some different balance and unans. But first, I wanted to understand how they work and what you can do and how to test them. So now I've got that far, I can start making them. So uh, please remember to like and subscribe and uh, see you in the next video.